You're listening to King Jesus Radio, the official podcast of New Living Way Church. In today's message, we will be in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. But before I get there, we are going to open up with a couple of other scriptures that are also part of this message. And the title of today's message is, Circumstance Never Takes Away Responsibility. Let's remember that in today's message. Circumstance never takes away responsibility. Amen? Well, this message came across um, Sunday, March 15th. And this message came through a time that we're living in some hard times, some confusing times, times we're just unsure, um, times of fear, times of doubt, times of despair. Not just as a Christian, but as a world, as a people, as humanity. And we've seen a lot of things unfold that we've never seen before, or just never really really lived through. This is something new to our leaders, new to us as a, as a, as a country, as in every area of our, our own companies that we work for, schools that we go to, different things. But we can be comforted today knowing that our God is Lord of all. Our God is above all. Our God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. And our God knows all things. And nothing is hidden from His sight. So this day, I pray that you are encouraged. And I believe you'll be encouraged because the Word of God is alive and it is powerful. And the Word of God does what the Word of God needs to do. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Father. I thank you for your word, my God. I thank you that, Father God, you have counted us worthy, Father God, to speak to us, Father God. I thank you, Father God, that you made a way for us, Father God, to come to you so we can hear your voice, Lord. And, Father God, that we can hear your voice, Father God, but not only hear your voice, but, Father, by your Spirit, you teach us the understanding, Lord. And you help us to live it, Father, and empower us to live it by your Spirit in the provision that we have in you, Lord God. Father, we just thank you this day, Lord, as we are here, Father God, Lord, just to receive your word, my God, as you, Father God, have given it to us, Lord. Because, Father God, when things are going haywire in our lives and the storms are raising, Father God, and so many things going on, Lord God, Father, we need to hear your voice, Lord. And, Father God, Lord, that's what we seek you for, Lord, to seek you while you may be found, Lord. And Lord, you are so faithful, my God, because Lord, you are Emmanuel, God with us. And Lord, we know that when we call upon your name, the name above all names, Jesus, you're with us, Lord. And not only are you with us, Lord, but you're in this world, Lord. You're above this world, my God. But Lord, as we call you, Lord Jesus, you're not a God God that is far off, but Lord, you are close to to us, Lord. Because you are with us, and Lord, as we put our faith in you, you are in us, my God. So, Father, thank you this day, Lord. Thank you for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the Son of God, born of a virgin, and that you went to that cross and paid that price for us and died on that cross for our sins. But you rose again on the third day, proving that you are the Son of God. And your word says that You ascended on high at the right hand of the Father, Lord, and now you are interceding for us day and night. But you didn't leave us as orphans, Lord Jesus, as you said. You would pray to the Father to send the Helper, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, a person. And that Holy Spirit now lives inside of all those who have put their faith in you, Lord. That have believed in their heart and confessed you as the Lord and Savior today, Lord. And Lord, if there be anyone today listening to this message, Lord, Lord, let them know that there is a name above all names that they can call upon. A name that will never look at their call coming in and ignore it. A name that when they call, Lord God, and that person is not there, Lord, they don't answer. But Lord Jesus, you do, Lord. We may not always understand, Lord, how you answer us, Lord. But Lord Jesus, you have answered us because you are the answer, Lord. And Lord Jesus, you are that perfect peace. You are the salvation. You are forgiveness, restoration, reconciliation. It's all found in you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we just thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love, Lord. We thank you, Father God, for your word, my Lord. 
And Father, we just thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So today as we open up, we're going to open up in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. He says here, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And another version may say self-discipline. So imagine this. In order for God to give us something, the other day we were studying what I do have. And in order for us to be able to receive something from someone, they first have to have it. If they don't have it, then they can't give it. It's like if my wife has a drink from Starbucks, and my kids come to me and I say, hey, you guys want a drink? Well, I'm giving them something that I really don't have because it's not mine. As soon as she finds out, she'll be like, hey, that's not, what are you doing? That's not your drink. But if it's mine, then I can give it because it's mine. I have it. I, I, I'm, in, I'm holding it. So therefore, we know that what God has given us, that is salvation, has given us forgiveness, has given us His Holy Spirit. We have all that we need in Christ Jesus. Because He has the power and authority to give it because He owns it because He is it. Because it's His presence, it's His authority, it's all that He is and all that we believe in. Praise God for that. We have so much in Christ, and let me encourage you to read the Word of God. Especially in these times, read the Word of God. Because as you believe it to be the Word of God, then this is God speaking to me and you. Oh, and when you find out all that we have in Christ Jesus, I, I still don't know, I can't even comprehend it, but the little pieces that He gives me, changed my whole life. But right here in this scripture, he says, this is something he did not give me and you then. So he says, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear. So the spirit that he gave me and you, the Holy Spirit, that has nothing to do with fear. So if we are fearful today, the question has to be, is that from God? Now, yes, we have a holy fear, a reverence, and yes, it can be even a fear of death unto because of God, because He is so holy. It could be a terror, yes, that is the fear of God as well. But in this portion of Scripture, He is dealing with fear. And a sense of not doing what God has called us to do, what He's given us. Because in the scripture before that he says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So this was something that was imparted, something that God had placed inside of him, something that was stirred up in this place of prayer. And he's telling them, don't be afraid of it, have boldness and have confidence in it. Be encouraged today. That it's not a matter of what you have, it's a matter of what's been given to you in Christ Jesus. It's a matter of who you have. But one of the things you don't have is a spirit of fear because He didn't give you a spirit of fear. Fear is a natural reaction. Fear is emotion. Fear is something that we all deal with and it is real. Fear will, will grip me in you. Fear will overwhelm me in you. Fear will bring death. Fear can just cripple me in you. And fear is a real thing. I'm not saying today that fear is not real. We live in some trying times today and fear is very real. Not just in the, in the, in the unbeliever, but in the believer as well. Because even as a Christian, fear can grip me and you. Today is not about acting like, oh, I'm not fearful, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid, but yet you are afraid. But what it is, it's recognizing that fear. It's recognizing, God, I am afraid. But Lord, I trust you, Lord, because I recognize that it's not you that has given me this fear. Though I have it, but you are greater than this fear, Lord God. It's acknowledging that that fear is not from God. Because many times we start to look at it, well, God, why are you doing this? Why have you allowed this? Why? No, it's not God. This is just sin. This is the world. This is just natural things. It rains on the just and the unjust.
But what you can remind yourself today is, in that sphere, in that fear, you could remind my, yourself and myself, <laughs> through my name in there, but God, you didn't give me a spirit of fear, so I know this is not from you. But you did give me a, po- a spirit of power and love and self-control. Sound mind, self-discipline. That you did give me. You gave me your Holy Spirit to walk in the power and the authority of all that you are, Lord. A spirit of love knowing that I am loved by God because you love me and in that you teach me and show me how to love others. Not in just the words that I say, but in the, in the actions and the life that I live. Walking in the power of God, but it's the power of God working in me, through me, and all about me. Transforming me to be more like Christ. The power of God. And of self-control, that self-discipline, that sound mind. That's what He did give me in you. This is possible. But it's all in Christ. So why do we struggle with fear? Why does it overwhelm me and you so much? Well, it's a real thing. Especially when you're around many people that are fearful. We all feed off each other. But let's look at this scripture in 1 John chapter 4, verse 13 through 21. He says, By this we know that we abide in Him, and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe... The love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because He first loved us. Wow. Be encouraged and realize that in your fears, don't allow that to doubt the love of God. Don't ever, don't allow that to make you question, well, does God even love me? If He loved me, why would He allow this? Why is this going on? Why all this? No. Remind yourself how much God loves you. Well, I don't know how He loves me. I don't know this. Well, you want to know how He loves you? He sent His Son, Jesus, who was sinless. To die on that cross for me and you. To become that perfect sacrifice that was accepted unto God. That was a pleasing aroma for me and you. He paid the price and the penalty that me and you should have paid. But He stepped in and paid that price for me and you. So that me and you could have a relationship with God the Father. See, God didn't have to tell us He loves us. He showed us His love in His Son, Jesus. And because of our faith in Him today, if we choose to believe in Him, we choose to repent of our sins, we choose to acknowledge, as just as we talked about acknowledging I am fearful, we also have to acknowledge our sin and acknowledge I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I repent. Forgive me of my sins. Restore me and fill me with your Holy Spirit because I believe you are the Son of God and I believe that all that you have done for me. And in that, there is, a, there is this a change. Because all of a sudden, we are made right with God the Father through His Son, Jesus. 
Because now when God the Father sees me in you, he sees us in his son, Jesus. Perfect, blameless, accepted, righteous, holy. So even though me and you are fearful today, and not just because of what's going on, but we have fears every day. If you're a parent, you have fears for your children. If you're a, a spouse, you have fears for your spouse. If you're, you know, whatever circumstance you're in, you always have some sort of fear. Financially, physically, um, relationships, your job, whatever it is, there's always some sort of fear going on within all of us. It's just when we come across someone who has those same fears, we tend to feed on those fears and it can grow even greater as we see today in this world. But let me encourage you today as I have to encourage myself. It doesn't change the fact that God loves me. It doesn't change the fact that God loves you. And if we want to overcome fear, we need to be reminded. We need to confess to the Lord and we need to remind ourselves and we need to remind this soul that Lord God loves me. I know that He loves me because He gave His Son for me. The Bible says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son and that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, praise the Lord for that. Praise Jesus for that. Thank you, Father, that you love me so much. And as we start to declare the love of God that he has for us, the love of God that he has for this world, the love of God, we start to see things through the love of God's eyes. We start to see things. Yes, there are some things going on. There are some circumstances. There are some situation. But it doesn't change the fact that God loves this person and that God can deliver and save this person and that God can give this person peace and comfort and can heal and deliver this person because I know that because he did it for me and he continually does it for me. And that's how we start to over overcome the fear of this world because we recognize the love that God has for us. So be encouraged today that God loves you. God loves you. And He showed us that love in Jesus Christ. And that love is still available for all today. For God said, the Word of God says that He is patient and long suffering, that none shall perish, but all shall come to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is a patient. God and he is a loving God oh I know he's more patient than me I, far beyond I can't even compare but thank God he is because he is so patient with me but look what it says in verse 20 if anyone says I love God and hates his brother he is a liar for he who does not love his brother whom he has not who he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Must also love his brother. It's in that recognizing that we also have a responsibility with that same love to love one another. That when you see somebody fearful, that we don't start to accuse them or tell them, well, what did you do? Or what did you do? No. Yes, there may come a time where there has to be some truth. Yes, but it's still done in love. But we can tell them, we don't understand. I don't understand this, but I know that God loves me and you. And I know that he can bring us through. And I know he can be our peace. And I know he can provide. And I know that he is faithful. And I'm not saying that we don't speak the truth because we speak the truth to our brothers and sisters, to those that we love because we love them. So yes, there may be some times that you're going to have to have some strong words of truth, but we're doing it because we love them, because we want to see them turn back to God. Not to condemn them, not to tear them down, but to build them up so they can have life. But it comes from the recognition of understanding but because I know that God loves me, I know He loves you. And therefore, I love you with the love of God. And it's not so much in our words, but in our actions and how we treat one another. And what we do for one another. 
And sometimes it's not, we can't hold on to that unforgiveness because, well, then we're holding something against someone that we shouldn't be. And how can we do that if God doesn't hold what we did against us when we asked for forgiveness and repented? But we have a responsibility to love one another. Doesn't mean we'll always like each other, but we do have a responsibility to love one another. But see here in Acts chapter 28, when you could recognize that there is a purpose, there is a plan, and that God loves you, that no matter what you go through, or what you face, or what we face, but yet because we know and believe that God loves us, we know that He's in control of it, and there's a reason and a purpose for it, and it's to bring Him glory. And this scripture, this is a man by the name of Paul. In Acts chapter 28, verse 1 through 6, this man had just been shipwrecked. This man has been through some stuff. And now he gets to Malta. And it says in verse 1, After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. And the native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and it was cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Wow. So this man goes in, he's in a shipwreck, finally gets to this island. But what I love about Paul is he goes through all this and nevertheless he continues to serve. He went and got the sticks for the fire. And it was because he was in the serving that he got bit by the snake. And many times when we go through stuff, we don't want to continue to serve. But we got to continue to serve because we're doing it because God loves us. Through the shipwreck, through the storm, through everything. But we got to continue to serve God recognizing I have a purpose. And that purpose is God's purpose. And I know he's going to bring me through it because he loves me. And this is how we overcome fear because then we're continually able to keep going forward even when we're in the house of the Lord, even when we're serving God and everything doesn't seem to be going right. And all of a sudden it's like, man, I keep serving God. I keep showing up. I keep doing this. But Lord, it's because I love you because you love me first. And we keep doing it. But yet things don't seem to turn around. And all of a sudden we get people saying, well, what did you do, brother? What did you do, sister? What did is going on in your life. You got some sin in your life. You got to deal with this. You got to repent. And you're like, but I've repented already. I've, I've repented. I mean, I know I got sin. I know there's things going on, but I just feel like, man, I got a bum rap. But when we can come to a place as Paul did here, recognizing no matter what I face or what I go through, Paul was told, tell him the things that he must suffer for my name. God didn't hide anything from him because Christ suffered, so will you. But we go through recognizing even through the suffering does not change the love that God has for me and you. So in that is we are reminded of the love that God has for us in his son Jesus. We can recognize as the word says nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Paul in this instant is bitten by the viper. Everyone's looking on thinking man this even even this man came out of it and Look, he's still not able to be let go. But look at what Paul does. In verse 5 he says, He, however, shook off the creature, creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. See, Paul could have been fearful. 
Paul could have said, oh my God, it's a snake. Because if a snake is hanging on your hand, then that thing has got a grip on you. Those teeth are sunken in there. That's going to bring some fear, especially if you got to shake that thing off or you got to pull it off. It's one thing to be bitten, but it's another thing for that thing to stay on you because of that bite. But it says that Paul shook it off. Paul knew he had a purpose. Paul knew he was called by God. Paul knew that God loved him. And he shook it off and he kept going and no harm befell him. And what did that do? It brought glory to God. Yeah, they said he's a God. But he wasn't, he's not a God. But there was a God in him who had given him a purpose. And because he knew that God loved him, he was able to walk in that purpose. Mark chapter 16, verse 15 says to 20, And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Another version says, and confirmed the word. Confirmed God's word. Confirmed the message. The message of who? Jesus Christ. The gospel. So let me encourage you today. While you do, God will take care of you. Don't stop doing. Doing what? Living for Him. He says to go and do these things, and as you do them, I will do through you, and I will show who I am through you. And what was that, that mission? To bring the message, to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be the very presence in this world that others can know the God that loves them through His Son, Jesus Christ, by the love He has showed to me and you. And it's not a matter of going and saying, here, I want to get a snake and I want it to bite me because I want, you, I want you to see how much God's got me. No, it's as you keep living, as you keep serving, as you keep doing. And when there's a trip up, when there's an issue, when there's a circumstance, when there's a lack, when there's a sickness, whatever it may be going on. But when you keep doing, you keep walking by faith and not by sight, recognizing that faith without works is dead. But I'm going to be a man or woman of faith. I'm going to be a child of God. I'm going to walk in the faith of God believing. And though it may not feel good and though I can't see it. But I'm going to keep doing. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep saying. I'm going to keep living for Him. And in that, God meets you right where you're at. Because it's His purpose in your life, not your own. And this is the authority He gives, not to me and you, but it's His authority in me and you. And we can trust Him because we believe that He loves us. We believe that He loves us. I pray that you believe that God loves you today. Because He really does. He really does love you today. And so we get to our key verse here today. And this is the portion of circumstance never takes away responsibility. And we'll be in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 through 32. Circumstance never takes away responsibility. He 
He says here in verse 17, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. So right here he's saying, you must no longer walk. So in order to no longer, that means I must have walked this way. <laughs> it must mean that I may still be walking this way. But thank God we're walking by faith and we're learning how to no longer walk that way. And we're work, looking at this word walk is to live. And in the Hebrew, it's, it's referred to a Hebrew word to live, to regulate one's life. And basically to govern or direct according to rule. Where you have that control, where you regulate your life accordingly. You have rules, you have things, you, things you live by, you have that control. The only one that can do that for you is you. You have to make that decision to regulate one's life. Another area is to conduct one's life, to cause oneself to act or behave in a particular way, especially in a controlled manner. So it's how you conduct yourself no matter the situation. It's where you're at. You ever hear you tell the child, hey, behave, you can conduct yourself, behave, sit still. Well, it's the same way that someone who comes to learn how to do that on their own. It's a way of living. You learn how to regulate your life and you learn how to conduct your life. You learn how to live under these disciplines. And the other one is to pass one's life. The state of being actual or complete, an example of, of goals came to pass. And really it's just using the time wisely with the time that me and you have. What we do to pass with this time that we do have in this place. Now remember, this is not based upon, we should do this in the natural, and many do do this, many do this very well, but majority of us don't. <laughs> we may do it okay in certain areas, and in other areas we don't. Others do this in many areas great. They're just great at this, man. They just got the self-discipline on it, man. They can hit the gym. They could be up at 4 or 5 in the morning. They can do all these things. They, they're hitting that whatever they got to do and taking care of whatever they got to take care of. And that is awesome. Thank God for you. Praise the Lord for you. But majority of us are not like that. <laughs> It's a struggle. I'm not saying that everybody doesn't have a struggle, but many of us do have a struggle with this. We struggle in our finances. We struggle in our time. We struggle in our, in our relationships. We struggle in our jobs. Whatever it is, we, we, you know, we become very sidetracked, distracted. This is just a normality for a lot of us. But see, this is where the Bible says, I did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power of love and of a sound mind or self-discipline, self-control. See, it's not me and you dependent upon ourselves, but we have to have a willingness to acknowledge it and want it and ask the Holy Spirit to now help us through His Word to teach us how to allow our lives to be regulated, conducted, and to learn how to pass that time in Him. To live in Him and recognizing, Lord, I'm going to live in You. I'm going to walk following You, so I'm no longer going to walk the way that everyone else walks. I'm no longer going to live the way that everybody else lives. Yeah, I may say a couple things, I may do a couple things, I may do this, but I see it differently because I recognize and see it for what now it really is. And that's not me and you, that's just the Holy Spirit living in us, that is the light of the world and the salt of the earth, that has brought those things to light, and now we can see it for what it is. Not everything, but some things. There are just some things we just either choose not to see, we don't really realize is there, or it's just not time for, it's just a work in progress. But he is saying in this, but no longer live or walk this way the way they do this. And it says, and how? In the futility of their minds. And that word is just saying vanity, devoid of truth. Futile is where this word comes from, and it means serving no useful purpose. Whoa! We've been talking about this whole time that God has a purpose for us. The Bible says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. That he that began a good work in you will see it to completion unto the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God is, I know that my God is working all things out for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. 
God is a faithful God who has called me and you with a purpose. You have a purpose today. But he is saying no longer walk as those who walk with no purpose. No useful purpose or believe they serve no purpose. That they're just here filling air. They're just here because they're here. They're here because they were an accident. Well, let me tell you something today. You were not an accident. Though maybe your parents didn't plan you, you might not have been planned. You might not even have planned your own kids. But let me tell you something. There was a plan for them from long ago. The Bible says that He predestined you. The Bible says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. The Bible says His thoughts towards you outnumber the grains of sand. The Bible says He chose you before the foundations of the world. The Bible says He knitted you in your mother's womb. The Bible says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are no accident. You are no mistake. God has a purpose for you. You can choose to live that way if you like. It's your choice. It's my choice. But I choose today to say, no, Lord, I want to live with a purpose, your purpose, Lord. Because it's not my purpose, but it's His purpose. This is that full life that we can live in Christ. Recognizing that every day, Lord, there is a plan and a purpose for me, Lord. And it's your plan and purpose for me. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19-27, through 27, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessings. See, Paul wasn't talking about compromising. Paul wasn't talking about falling into sin and saying, well, I got to be a light in a dark place. No, but Paul was recognizing and understanding in the gift and grace of God where these people were coming from. So whether they were under the law, whether whether they were a Jew, whether they were weak, no matter what it may have been, Paul never put himself up in a higher level than them. He laid him down as a, himself as a bond servant, humbled himself, and understood and came from a place of understanding this is where they're coming from. He may not have understood exactly where they were coming from, but he knew that God loved them. And he was able to do this because it was all for the sake of being able to share the gospel that there is a God who loves them. There is a God who has a purpose for them. There is a God who can deliver them and save them and heal them. And there is a God like no other God, the God above all gods, Lord of lords and King of kings. See, what we do is all for the sake of the gospel. It's all for the glory of God. It's all for the purpose of God to bring Him glory and to draw that others are drawn to Him by His Spirit. But see, this is what gave Paul that purpose. This is what gave Paul everything that he went through, but yet he recognized But there was a purpose for it all. There was a reason for it all. And there is a reason and a purpose for all that you face and go through, but nevertheless, God is faithful. God is faithful. God is so faithful. He will never leave you and He will never forsake you. He says here in verse 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives a prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So he's saying, I do this diligently. I have to discipline myself. I have to remind myself. I have to be in a place, Lord God, thank you for your love, oh God. I got to be in a place that, Lord, though I 
I'm free to do this and free to do that. But Lord God, I want, I don't want to do it because if you don't want me to do it, Lord, I want to be a light to those around me, Lord God. I want to be a blessing, Lord God. I want others to come to know you, Lord God. Not because of me, but because of you in me, so they can see you and be drawn to you, Lord God. But he's doing this with a purpose. And he uses an example of the athlete. If someone wants to be great in, as an athlete, and there are many greats that don't make it, but there are just some that just go that extra step. They put in that extra time, they got that extra heart, and they are just disciplined. And we see right now no sports, but many of these men and women that are in sports and preparing for the Olympics and all these different things, they put their time and effort in there. They discipline their body, they discipline their mind because they realize that when they get out there, they got a purpose. When they wake up in the morning, they realize, I got a purpose today. My purpose is to go do my best, to bring a championship, to do the best for my team, whatever the reason may be. But they go and they do with a purpose. But that's a temporary purpose. It's a a good purpose but it's a temporary one because eventually it's going to end but what I love in these recent days with everything that is going on there are some basketball players and some sports players that right now are not able to do the purpose and the purpose that they're used to doing because they're not able to play the sports because it's shut down but even in that you got a couple of players here that are now recognizing that in their purpose, that's not just their purpose, that's a, that's a purpose to get them to their greater purpose. And now many of them are donating money so that the employees of these stadiums can continue to get paid. They're not living without purpose. They recognize that their purpose, basketball is a tool, or football, or whatever it may be, it's a tool to get them to recognize there is more to their purpose because that's only a part of their purpose. Because it's about serving others. This isn't a human term. Now, don't get me wrong. Many of them may be believers and they do it unto the Lord. Praise God for that. I don't know their hearts in that, but thank God for them. Because that's what it should be about, is to about helping one another, recognizing that in my purpose is to help others around me, to be a blessing to others, and that all that I have is to be, a, be able to be a blessing to others. And even in the little I have, that I could still be a blessing to others. So we could come together as a people. So we can come together and encourage and support one another. And we could come together and help each other in time of need. Not just in these times, but in every day of our lives. And this is our purpose. This is the goal of a Christian to recognize I have a purpose and it is God's purpose. And it's to live a life seeking God. It's to live a life regulated by God. It's a, to live a life, my, my life is conducted by God. Where the time that I have is all in God's hands. And everything that I have is in God. So that others can see Christ in me. That others can see the love that God has for me. That's what I can boast and tell them how much God loves me, but so I can tell them how much God loves them. But we do it and recognize that every day mean you get up today, you put your faith in Christ, you have been called, you have been set apart because he calls you holy and blameless for his purpose. And that purpose still remains no matter the circumstance, no matter the change in the world, no matter the weather, no matter how you feel, no matter how you're going through, no matter what is going on, especially in this time right now. But it doesn't change the responsibility that me and you have as a believer. And that is to continue to walk in the purpose and the plan of God that He predestined, that He knew, that He chose, and that He formed us for. That He died and rose again on the third day for that he ascended on high four, that he sent his Holy Spirit for, and that one day he's going to come back again for. 
Oh, hallelujah. You have purpose today. Everything we do, we do to bring glory to God. Let us not lose focus because of circumstance. We continue to live in His purpose. And the real purpose is salvation for those who do not know Him. This is not about the coronavirus. This is not about anything else that's going on today. This is about a world that is separated from God because of sin. A people that is separated from God because of sin. I was separated from God because of sin, but because of Jesus. I am now restored and have reconciled to God the Father and now I can have a relationship with Him and I know that He hears me and I know what He's done in my life and I know all that He's done and continuing to do and it's just like, wow, Lord, thank You so much for that. This message isn't so... We can, you know, of course we're crying out to God for mercy. We're asking for healing. Yes, of course we're praying for the people that have been affected by this and that are sick with it right now. People that have lost loved ones. This is a real situation. But we cannot lose focus that it's also in this time and every time that the message is still the same. God came to seek and to save that which was lost. To give sight to the blind, to open the ears of the deaf, to give a voice to the mute, to raise up the lame that they may walk. Because that man, when Peter and John lifted him up, he went into that temple praising and leaping, jumping and leaping and praising God. Let us not lose focus. That's why me and you have a purpose today. It's because no matter what goes on in the storms of life, we have a Lord Jesus that can get up and say, Peace be still. He is our peace in the midst of the chaos. Even when our mind is chaotic and our body and everything around us, our feelings, our emotions, everything, but He's still the peace in that chaos. Because I know that I have a peace with God that no money, no relationship, nothing of this world could ever fill that void that I had before Christ came into my heart and made me whole in Him. Verse 18 of chapter 4 of Ephesians says, They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. To be callous is when I was learning how to play guitar, my fingers would get cut up and they would they would bleed sometimes. And it would hurt to play. I would have to like couldn't play too long because when they were cut up, it was hard. But the more I played, what ended up happening is there became an outer piece of skin and it became calloused. And over time, I no longer felt the pain and no longer cut me because I grew a callus on my fingers to be able to play this guitar. Well, that's how we can become and have become as a people and even as believers many times, our hearts can become callous if we choose to reject His love for us. But verse 20 says, But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through de deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are all members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief steal no longer, 
but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. These are some of the examples of us putting off that old self, remembering that we no longer walk in these ways and live in these ways anymore. When we allow God to do some change, but there is a, we, are, we do have our responsibility. And many times because of the circumstance, we think, well, I don't have to do this right now. I mean, there's just too much going on, but it's not so. We need to even do it more and grow in this area more. Look at chapter 5, verse 15. It says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The other day when we came together for the class in Emmanuel, God with us, we went into prayer at the end of that service, and through that, a psalm of thanksgiving came through and it was so beautiful because in that psalm we were encouraged as the Lord spoke through that psalm. Let me encourage you today, don't stop praising the Lord. You got a psalm in your heart. You got a song in your heart. You got a malady in your heart. Start letting that out and singing unto the Lord. Because it's not just for you, but it's for all of us together as a body of Christ. Don't worry about your voice. Don't worry about the words. Don't worry. No, you just do it with your heart and start singing unto the Lord. You got a great voice. Praise the Lord. You don't have a voice. Praise the Lord. But you do it from your heart because it's an act and a heart of worship. And you're doing this and we're doing this together because we are submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. How we live is submission to Christ. The circumstances never take away our responsibility. We will be tempted not to, but we need to. We need to. Only then can we understand. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Well, how do I do this? You keep living how you were living following Christ, no matter the circumstance. Verse 22 says this, this is some examples. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and, and, his, and his himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that the she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. 
Chapter 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you might live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this you will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Just because a circumstance does not change the fact that you're still a husband, you're a wife, you're a father, you're a mother, you're a grandparent, you're an employee, you're a boss, you're an owner, you're a brother or sister in Christ, you're a child. It doesn't take the fact that we still have a responsibility to live a life submitted unto God. It's in submitting to God that we learn how to listen to Him and obey Him. That's why it's so important that we listen out for the Lord. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Because then only then can we truly understand Scripture, such as that Joshua 1.9, Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? If I don't understand how a command goes and how to heed to a command, then how am I going to understand when He tells me to be strong and courageous? He teaches me that way so I can understand His Word this way. How do we expect to heed to this command if we're not willing to submit to the responsibility He has given us? Oh, but when we do... When we learn how to heed to His voice, to the responsibility that we have living in that purpose that is His, in the power of His Holy Spirit, by the grace and mercy of Christ Jesus. Oh, this is what we have in Him. This is how we overcome. This is how we live in Him. And this is how we become victorious. It says in verse 10 of chapter 6 of Ephesians, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. So we're not being strong in ourselves, but we are being strong in the Lord. And he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end. And keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in the opening of my mouth, boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak." Be strong in the Lord. So when we are following along and we are continuing to live in that purpose, he says to be strong in him. Take up his armor. Oh, how many of us know today that that is an order, that is a command, that is a, a request. But let me tell you something. Never take off that armor because that armor has nothing to do with me or you, but it has to do with being in Christ Jesus, recognizing all that we have and 
it all has to do with the love of God because this all has to do with the gospel. Every part of that armor has to do with Christ and the good news of, of, of Jesus Christ and everything in him. And not only that, but he says to continue in that also praying for the saints to pray for him. So then even in that, he goes into all the responsibility then he says what well, we have in this responsibility and not only that he goes back to the responsibility and that is to pray for one another that is to pray for our brothers and sisters that is to pray for those that are bringing forth the word of God that is to pray for this world that is to pray for those that don't know, yet know the Lord that is to declare and know who your God is recognizing how much he loves me and you The circumstance never takes away the responsibility. Me and you still have a responsibility in Christ Jesus to follow Him, to live in that plan and purpose, to trust Him, to wait on Him, to believe in Him, and to know that all things are possible for Him, to know that He has all the power, all the authority, and He has the right to change, He has the right to shift, He has the right to do whatever He wants to do, because He has all the power and authority, and and he proved that in his death and resurrection at the cross. That is your God. That is my God. That could be your God today if you choose to put your faith in him. Because he is alive. Father, thank you this day. Thank you for your word, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your purpose, my God. But thank you for your love, Lord. Lord, you love this world. You loved it so much that you sent your son to die for it, Lord. One that was sinless that became sin for us, Lord. Thank you for that, Father, because today... We can have boldness and confidence as we come to you in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Believing and knowing that you hear us, but not only do you hear us, but you answer us according to your will, Lord. Father, many today are hurting. Many today are fearful, Lord. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you for the children of God, your people, to continue to live in that purpose so that others can see, Father, your love within us as your people, Lord. That others will be drawn to you, Father God. That others, Father God, will know you, Lord Jesus. And that others, Father God, Lord Jesus, can also learn to live in that purpose that you have for them, Lord. Lord, the circumstance does not change, Father God, our responsibility to remain civil, to remain focused, to continue to seek you and your wisdom and your truth, and your guidance, Lord. And Father God, to pray for all those around us in this world, my God. Father, in Jesus' name, the leaders of this world need your wisdom and guidance, Lord, through these times, Lord. Our leaders in this country, Lord, we ask you, Father, for your wisdom in this time, Father, of what and how and when to do the things that need to be done, Lord. We recognize, Lord, that you're in control of it all, my God. Father, we thank you for our leaders. And Lord, though we may not always agree with our leaders, but we recognize, Father, that Lord, you've allowed them to be in the positions they're in for a reason and a purpose, Lord. And for a season, for whatever it may be, Lord, we trust you. And we thank you for our leaders, Lord. And we ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, that Father, you would bring us together as a world to work together, Lord, to encourage one another, Lord. 
Father God, we as a people that we would come together, we as a church would come together as a body of Christ. Father, we lift up all the business owners, Lord, companies, franchises, Lord, that are, Father, in the place of what do we do, how do we do it, Lord. But Father, today we ask you for the wisdom that they need, Lord Jesus, to it. For all those that are in ministry in churches, my God, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you for the wisdom that we need in these times, Lord, to make those decisions, the hard decisions, Lord, but the necessary decisions that need to be made, Father God. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we lift up all the people today that have been infect infected, Lord Jesus, with this virus, Lord. Father, comfort them, Lord. Bring them healing, Lord. Be with them through the healing, my God. We lift up all those today that have lost someone to this virus, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to comfort them in this time. Father, in the name of Jesus, many that are fearful, Lord God, that they may have it, Lord, and not sure. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you right now to comfort them in Jesus' name. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy upon us, Father God. Have mercy upon this world in Jesus' name, Lord that we may walk in your grace, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, you are the healer, Lord. And I ask you in Jesus' name, Lord, for healing in your people, for those that are sick today with this virus, Lord. Father, I know they're looking for a vaccine, my God, but you are the great physician. You are the God that healeth thee. Jesus, you are the healer, Lord, and all things are possible for you, Lord. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus that you would start to touch those that are infected, Lord God, and that in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, you would raise up and bring to life, Father God, God those, my God, that have been laid out with this sickness, Lord, that are quarantined, that are self-quarantined right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, bring them back. Raise up their immune system, Lord. Give them life, Lord, in the name of Jesus all across the world, my God. Father, we ask you for the peace in our communities, Lord. As many are going rampant, Father, trying to hoard and store up so many things, my God. But Lord, thank you that we know that our treasure is stored in heaven, my God. Thank you that you already know what we need even before we ask you, Father. So help us as believers to be those that are wise, that are discerning, that Father will be looking out for those in need, my God, that we can share or Father split, my God. But not looking that, Lord, it's only me and that's it, my God. But Lord, recognizing that we're all in this together as a people, my God. And Father, in the name of Jesus, I just ask you, Lord, that Lord, your peace, my God, would be upon this land and upon the people in this country, in our cities, Lord, in our world, my God. That, Father God, that we would recognize, Lord Jesus, what's the use of surviving, Father, Lord, if there's really no one to survive with, my God. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we just ask you this day, Father, have mercy on us, Lord. But, Father, also, Lord, we turn our hearts back to you, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, let the fear, Father, that is going on, Lord, Father, in the name of Jesus, let that turn into a holy fear to turn us to you, Lord God, so we could be reminded of how much you love us, Father. Father, thank you right now, Lord. Thank you for your comfort. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your joy. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for you are all that we need, Lord. And Lord, when we have nothing else to say or don't know what to say, or we're just overwhelmed, Lord. Thank you that we have the name above all names. Jesus. Jesus. And no matter what language we say your name in, Lord. Lord. Your name is powerful. And there is power in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. And we pray. And we say, Amen. Amen. Good morning. We're going to be in Ezra chapter 2, verse 1 through 58 this morning. 
Ezra chapter 2, verse 1 through 58. Bit of a long chapter, a lot of names going to be written in here, but there's a reason and a purpose for it. Amen? <laughs> so we'll start up here, Ezra chapter 1. I'm sorry, chapter 2. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 1 through 58. Reverend Cotto, will you open us up in prayer, please? Good morning, Father. Good morning, Son. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Father, this is a day that you made, and we're just going to rejoice in you glad it. Father, have your way. Let your word go forth and not return void. Bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So I'm going to start here in verse 1 of chapter 58. And I'm only going to read all of this once and then we'll go back. We're going to kind of break everything down from the first couple of verses. And it says here in verse 1 of chapter 2 of Ezra, Now these were the people of the province who came up out of the captivity of, ex of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive to Babylonia. They returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his own town. They came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Zeriah, Reliah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Bigvi, Rehum, and Bena. The number of the men of the people of Israel, the sons of Parash, 2,172. The sons of Shephatiah, 372. The sons of Ara, 775. The sons of Pahath Moab, namely the sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2,812. The sons of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Zatu, 945. The sons of Zakai, 760. The sons of Bani, 642. The sons of Bebai, 623. The sons of Asgad, 1,222. The sons of Adunikam, 666. The sons of Bigvi, 2,056. The sons of Adin, 454. The sons of Ater, namely of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Bezai, 300. 23, the sons of Jorah, 112, the sons of Hashum, 223, the sons of Gebar, 95, the sons of Bethlehem, 123. The men of Netophah, 56. The men of Anatoth, 128. The sons of Asmaveth, 42. The sons of Kiriath Aram, Chephara, and Birath, 743. The sons of Ramah and Geba, 621. The, son, the men of Michmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 223. The sons of Nebo, 52. The sons of Machbish, 156. The sons of the other Elam, 1254. The sons of Haram, 320. The sons of Lod, Hadid, and Ono, 725. The sons of Jericho, 345. And the sons of Sena, 3,630. Now the priests, the sons of Jediah of the house of Jeshua, 973, the sons of Emer, 1,052, the sons of Peshur, 1,247, the sons of Haram, 1,017, the Levites, the sons of Jeshua and Cadmiel of the sons of Hadaviah, 74, the singers, the sons of Asaph, 128, the sons of the gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Atur, the sons of Talman, the sons of Akub, the sons of Hat Hatim, and the sons of Shobai in all 139. The temple servants, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hesufa, the sons of Teboat, the sons of Keros, the sons of Sihiah, the sons of Padan, the sons of Lebana, the sons of Hagabah, the sons of Akab, the sons of Hagab, the sons of Shemle, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Gidel, the sons of Gahar, the sons of Rehiah, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nekoda, the sons of Gazam, the sons of Uza, the sons of Pasea, the sons of Besai, the sons of Asna, the sons of Menum, the sons of Nephism, the sons of Babuk, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Haru, the sons of Bazluth, the sons of Mehida, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tima, the sons of Neziah, and the sons of Hatifa, the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Satai, the sons of Hasaphareth, the sons of Peruda, the sons of Jalad, the sons of Darkan, the sons of Yedel, the sons of Shephatai, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Pakareth, Hasbeam, the sons of Ami, and all the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's were 392. Amen? That's a lot of people. And the total assembly ended up coming out to about 42,360 people, that these people that were coming back. 
No, I just, I didn't practice that at home yesterday. I said, I'm just going to give it a shot and run right through it. Amen. So I read it once. I said, okay, we're going to, we're going to keep going through there. You know, and many times, you know, these portions of scripture, we can, you know, it's a lot of numbers, a lot of names and different like that. But, you know, if we're going through a study as what we're doing, that's why I feel it's very important to read it because it's part of the study. And if it was written, there's a reason and a purpose of why it was written, and why it's in here. So it definitely has a purpose and it definitely has an importance in here. And one of the main things that we know in this is that only those that from Judah and Benjamin actually came back for the re rebuilding and the restoration of the temple. And one of the main reasons why this is in here is because it was very important to make sure that you knew where your lineage was from. Yeah. Because not only that, they were very strict if you were able to be a part of the work of the rebuilding. Because in order to come back and to rebuild or have anything to do with the temple, you had to be a complete descendant of the Jewish people, of one of the tribes of Israel. So this is why it was so important that they knew their lineage and that this lineage was written out because they had to know where their lineage was from. And they had to know that they were coming back to a place and that they can actually come and rebuild the temple. If not, they would not even be allowed in the temple or around the temple because of that lineage. So this is where they had to make sure, and this is why this is in here, to confirm that these people that were coming back were all part of a lineage of the people that were part of servants serving in the temple in some sort of way. So definitely a reason and a purpose for that. Amen? So we're going to look at a couple of things here in verse 1. It says, Now these were the people of the province who came up out of captivity. And that province is just a district, and that district is just one as ruled by a judge, and referring to those that came out of Judah and, uh, and uh, Benjamin in these areas. Now, we look at this, and these are the people that were taken to captivity. So this word captivity, for them to be captive, this is what it's saying here. The word captivity is also comes from captive or to capture. And the Webster's define this as taken and held as or as a prisoner of war. So how many of us know to be taken in captivity? We always hear about POWs, different things like that. We still have some of our, our servicemen in some of those situations. You know, it's just part of war. You know, what they do is they take you because you're kind of a, you're, you're a, a bargaining tool because they can use you for that. And uh, so this is an, one of the words for that. The other, another word is to be kept within bonds to be confined. So definitely you're going as a prisoner. They're not, you know, not all the time are they treating you the best, you know, because you are a prisoner. You are the enemy and they only need you for a certain reason. Other than that, you'd probably be dead because if they didn't need you, they wouldn't keep you. But here's another version and, and this belief, this pertains more or less to the children of Israel in captivity because according to the scripture of how we read it. And look what it says here, to be, to be held under control of another but having the appearance of independence. So to be captive, to be held under control of another, but having the appearance of independence. Being held involuntarily because of a situation that makes, that makes free choice or departure difficult. Okay? So when we look at the children of Israel, we look at Judah, and we see them in captivity. Yes, in the beginning it was horrible. But as they came into the land of Nebuchadnezzar and Babylonia, and even when they were taken over by Persia, they still had freedoms. Yeah. And God told them, He says, plant, build, pray for the peace, because you're going to be there for a while. So they were living, and as we read a couple of weeks ago, or even last week, that some of them became quite wealthy. Some of them built lives. Some of them became a part of that society and that culture because they got so comfortable. But even though it looked like they had independence, they were not really free because they could not have the freedom to go back to their land. They could not have the freedom to say, you know what, I'm going to get up, I'm going to go back to my land, I'm going to do this. No, they did not have that freedom to even really worship their God. They didn't have a temple. They didn't have any of this. They were, their, their background was destroyed. So though they had independence, their independence was really, they were still captive. It just looked like they had independence. But the reality is they were still ran by Persia. And we look at that and we think of the attitude of the, of the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. 
They say it was better for us in Egypt. At least there we had water. At least there we had this. And even though in their slavery, they still felt that they had independence, not realizing they were held captive. Egypt was able to do whatever they felt like doing. And not to mention, Egypt did that purposely. They enslaved them purposely. It says that Pharaoh and the, and they saw the people. They said, these people are numerous. They just continue to keep multiplying. We need to do something. They're more than us. And one of these days, they're going to realize they can overtake us. So what do we do? We enslave them. Not only do we enslave their, their body, but we enslave their minds to the point where they can never realize that they're more numerous of, than us and they could actually overtake us. It's a place of thinking we're free, but we're really not. How many of us know, I mean, what are some examples of that today? Just look at the world today. I think Christianity fits yeah. very well in there because yeah. some people who know their God, know salvation but don't know the liberty and the freedom that they actually have in Christ and in that salvation. Yeah. There are people that are free today in Christianity but are still captive in some bondage in their lives. Yeah, exactly. But it's a form of feeling that they're independent. Or they think they're living as free, but in reality, we were there. We weren't living free. We still are not living free because honestly, the Bible says we're slaves to righteousness. We're servants of God. We belong to God. He is our Lord and He is our Master. But in that, we have so many freedoms because of the freedom we have in Him. And this is... What they're not, you know, they're coming out of this captivity and to be exiled is just basically to be carried away or to be um, removed. So when it's talking about this, it's saying who came up out of the captivity of those exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried captive to Babylonia. So this is a time that those were captive that were living the life. Now they're coming back and God is calling them back to come and rebuild the temple. People that realize we're not free here. We're not free here. It looks like we're free, but we're not free. And in order for them to come back, it says that God stirred up the hearts of the people. They had to know, man, this is not what it's about. I want to go back and serve. I want to go back and I want to build up this temple unto God. I want to have that freedom again to serve my God. That's what the children of Israel, that's all Moses was asking Pharaoh. Let us go out and so we can worship our God. All about coming back to that place of worshiping our God. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to look at the scripture here. Because exactly what you guys said, that's, it, that's what it is here. It says, Ephesians chapter 2, we'll read verse 1 through 10. And it says, You were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. We were all there. Following the course of this world, going along with everybody else. You know, somebody asked me the other day, Do you think that it was possible when Jesus cast out that, 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 uh, the legion of demons from that man, was there a demon for each one of those pigs? Because in order for all the pigs to go over the steep hill, could it be possible that all the demons went into every single one of those pigs and they all went out? I said, it's a possibility because there's different takes on the legion. Some believe it was 100, some believe it was over 2,000, which the legion represented. There's different takes on it. But what I do believe is there was enough pigs. I don't, even if it wasn't all of them, but I believe there was enough of the pigs that those demons went into that the others automatically followed. If you get enough, there could have been 10 pigs. But if you get enough of them 10 pigs pushing all the other pigs, all the other pigs are going to follow, and they all went over the cliff. Like you look at it today, the people that are operating here, some, some, have, but everybody's following. But everybody's following. And that's demonic. It's a natural reaction, but definitely it could be a foothold for the devil. And this is for us, he's saying, in which you once walked. You were, were, were like this, but he's saying, following the course of this world. But look who else, following the prince of the power of the air. 
the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience. Definitely a spiritual thing going on when fear comes upon the land. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, or His masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We were once captive. There are many today that are captive. There are many today that are Christians that are captive. But our prayer today is that we, that God will draw His people, that He would draw this world back from captivity. I wrote here, they returned and they came back. But God kept them in captivity. Not only was He in control of that captivity, but He also provided for them in that captivity. And He kept His promise to restore them. Many have walked away. Many are bound. Many hearts have been divided. Many have been distracted. But our prayer this morning is, Lord, you know every one of those people and every one of us by name. The Bible says he knows the numbers of hairs on our head. And when we look at all these names, imagine God knew every single one of those people. And he drawed them back for the work and the purpose to re that represented the presence of God, and that was to rebuild the temple. Amen. We don't need a, the Lord doesn't need to draw the people back to rebuild the temple. The temple's already built. But what He's drawing them back to is to be a part of the body of Christ. That represents the presence of God in this dark world. But how many of us know that we need to serve together? He says, you have not forgotten your people. Draw them back to their place in the body of Christ as you have placed them. As we read, they appeared to be living free, but they weren't. I wrote here, bring us back, Lord, a people reclaimed. Reclaim your people from sin, from fear, from doubt, from unbelief, from bondage from oppression, from captivity, call your people by name. Why? First Corinthians 12, 18. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as He chose. He places everyone in the body as He sees fit. Everybody has a place in the body of Christ. And God loves them. For those that are running, those that are bound, those that are sin, whatever it may be today. But our prayer this morning is, Lord, You know them by name. You know where they're at. They may think they're free, but they're in captivity, Lord. Call them out, Lord. Bring them back, Father, and place them in the back into the body of Christ. Remembering that there is a purpose. There is a reason why we're here. There's a reason why God saved us. And that is to be the very presence in this dark world. To be that light. Not our presence, but the presence that lives within us. And that is the Holy Spirit. The very presence of God. But that we could also be the vessels to be that voice of God. The ones that speak life into this world especially in these dark times, but whether what's going on now or what was not going on before,
this has always been the mission, this has always been the purpose, and this will always be the purpose. That's that the Lord can deliver those and save those that are in captivity. This will be our prayer this morning.